gym mode. <laughs> Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered 12-step program that will also teach us the eight spiritual principles found in the Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is a working discipleship program for our lives. The focus of the group is to deepen our relationship with Christ or for you to be introduced to Christ. Then we take an inventory of our lives and confess to God and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. We humbly ask God to remove our character defects so we can make amends and restitution to those we have harmed, except when to do so would harm them or others, and also forgive those who have hurt us. Then we continue this process through prayer and meditation to know God's will for us and the power to carry it out. With this spiritual awakening, we now carry this good news to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. This becomes our new pattern of living. Amen. All right, so tonight is testimony night, so we're going to talk about some hurts, habits, and hang-ups. So I need a volunteer to read hurts, please. Hurt. A hurt could be classified as any life experience that may have damaged your heart some offense against you that crippled your ability to deal with the world in a healthy way. Something that may have twisted your view of yourself, God, or others. Some common hurts include abandonment, abortion, abuse as a child or by a spouse, employer, or the church, adoption, betrayal, dysfunctional family, divorce, alcoholism, drug abuse, rage, neglect, rape, rejection, Cheating affairs and unforgiveness. All right. Can I get a different volunteer to read habits? Please go ahead. Habits tend to be unhealthy patterns that often start as a perceived remedy for some problem in your life, but end up turning into a chronic bad behavior or addiction. The habits are the repeat difficult trips you run to win the when the going gets tough and continually lead to trouble in your life, some com habits. common habits are abusive behavior, alcohol, bitterness, drugs, eating disorders, gambling, gossip, isolation, lying, self-harm, sexual integrity, spending problems, wasteful pursuits, workaholism, pornography addictions, cell phones. And cell phones. Cell phones. Alright, how about some hang ups? Lastly, hang ups are those roadblocks that keep you from progressing further in God's plan for your life. They're often shaped by some bent thinking you have you may have received as a child, or some unhealthy attitudes you may have adopted as a means of coping with life's challenges. Here are some common hang ups. Anger, anxiety, or worry. Arrogance, body image, bullying or bigotry, codependency, control, depression, fear, greed or envy, uh, guilt or false guilt and or shame, lack of self-control, lack of trust in God, laziness, materialism, passive aggressive behavior, people pleasing, perfectionism, Pride, procrastination, and sarcasm. Yeah, sarcasm. You know, sarcasm is a form of abuse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had that one, huh? You don't have that one. That's the only one I don't have. You need to throw those on papers and put checks on spot That's right. Yeah. 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 And check off the line. Okay. So what we will go over tonight is the eight principles and their uh, beatitudes that go with them. So, if Vicki, if you'll read the principle itself, then we will... I was going to say that the, the hurts, habits, and hang-ups are just to let you know that this is not just an alcohol drug recovery. Right. This is, you can be dealing with anything. Yeah, what she said. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So, since you're on a roll there, okay. uh, right. you'll read the principle. By the way, the big capital letters that are in front of it, uh, Celebrate Recovery makes everything into an acrostic so the big letters will actually spell recovery uh so there's that and anyway lesson 13. yeah and then the uh the beatitude that accompanies that will respond with that together so 
realize I'm not God, I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are Happy those, are those who, know who know they are spiritually poor. Matthew 5, 3. Earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to Him, and that He has the power to help me recover. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, 4. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Happy, Happy are the meek. Matthew 5, 5. Openly examine and confess my faults to, to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy, Happy are the pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask Him to remove my character defects. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. Matthew 5, 6. He evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me, and make amends for harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. Happy, Happy are the merciful, Matthew 5, 7. Happy are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. We reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and His will for my life and gain the power to follow His will. Happy are those who celebrate recovery. Yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. Matthew 5, 10. Okay, so we're back to the basket. You kind of offset uh, expenses and costs. Uh, so uh, um, if you have it, please. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. And Chris. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris. Sorry. I'm a super grateful believer, um, but I struggle with uh, trying to escape from life. I escape by video games, by reading, and by pornography, which is the one that has caused me trouble. Uh, today is 275, so we're well through the year, like yeah. three quarters of the way through. Today is the brightness of life, and it comes from John 12, uh, 46. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. <coughs> when, I was, <coughs> when I was a teenager, my family and I went to visit some famous caves in Missouri. After several hours inside, my eyes became adjusted to the darkness. The problem came when I went back out to the bright sunlight. My eyes actually hurt. It took a long time for them to adjust to normal sunlight. Spiritual darkness has the same effect on our spiritual eyes. We can get so used to the life we live in the darkness that it may actually be painful when we try to live our lives in the light. Pastor Rick Warren said it well. The truth will set you free, but first, it must make you miserable. It may make you miserable. When we first bring our hurts, hang-ups, and habits into the light, it may seem too bright to bear. But once we get adjusted to this new way of living, we will never want to return to the darkness. There is so much to see and do in the light. For one thing, we can see each other. So the light brings us out of isolation and into fellowship. We can't let fear keep us from all God wants to show us. So join me in this prayer. Father God, my eyes are still so weak and in pain from coming out of the darkness and into the light. Help me to get used to living comfortably in the light. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I was able to use this analogy. So for a lot of us, especially those of us that were addicted to drugs, you know, especially some of those heavy-duty drugs, you know, there's such a spiritual power that, that, that is involved with that whole process. Um, and so what God allowed me to see was that as I work these steps, the steps are kind of sunglasses to the spirit. You know, they're really dark and you really need them when we first start this process. And as we adjust to the light, then, you know, we're able to, to do that. You know, there's a lot of people, there's sunglasses to the spirit. Uh, there's a lot of people that can't come out of the darkness, especially that real dark place that some of those drugs will take us uh, into God's light because it's just too bright.
Mm. You know, that's why in the other fellowship, I'm kind of cautious about about proclaiming the name of Jesus uh, in front of a newcomer because that's kind of the exact thing that they struggle with is because that light's really bright and not everybody's ready for it right up front. So he's just teaching me some some caution and tolerance. So uh, tonight's testimony, um, I've heard her testimony multiple times and it changes as she changes. I think you've been, this your third time here? This is my second. Your, yeah. your second time here? Yeah, this is my second. And then I've been over there. Yeah, I've heard it a couple yeah. times at her home group too. Yeah. So uh, come on, tell us your story, Diane. Yeah. And it's Diana with an A, by the way. Oh, <laughs> that was me. That was me. Yeah, Diane. <laughs> Did I I, all you? my life, people have called me Diane. I'm like, no, it's Diana. All right, I'm putting this here, and I'm just going to point to it every oh, so often. Oh, I remember this one. This is a good one. <laughs> I think I did the font big enough for him to wear glasses. Yeah. So I've got to move my camera over because you're moving it. You keep this here. Yeah. So I just want to pray first. Okay. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity that Jimbo sprung on me last minute. <laughs> But I am grateful to be here, Lord, and I'm just asking you to calm my nerves and to help me just shine your light, Lord, and that people just see that this is truly your story, not mine, Lord, and this is what you've done in my life, but I give you all the glory. So I just thank you for what you've done, what you're continuing to do, and I ask that maybe there's something that I say tonight that speaks to each and every person here, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Hi, my name oh, is Diana. Look at, your, look at your picture. Whenever you're doing it, you sometimes <laughs> the candle. I can't see the bottom, so you have to hold it so. Well, what's that? If whenever you're telling your story. Oh, I'm just going to point to it, so it's all good. Okay, but it ain't going to be in the video then. Well, <laughs> can I bring this back? Yep, you sure can. Oh, it's there you go. There you that go. Are you able to see it That's then? better, yep. Okay. Is that true? Is that good? Yep, that's good. Okay. Yeah, you changed it already. That was Thank you very much. <laughs> I like that. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Diana, and I'm a grateful believer and follower of Jesus Christ. I usually introduce myself when I share all the things that I struggle with, but this time around, I'm doing things a little bit different. You see, those struggles don't identify who I am in Christ. I will, however, share how, about some of the struggles in just a few, but I am so excited to share how good God is and all that he's done in my life through the trials and through the attacks of the enemy. Hi, Diana. Hi, Diana. I will share a little bit about the addiction that I went through, but that is a part of my past and just a part of my story. There's so much more that I want to share with you, and my prayer is that you leave here with hope and the acknowledgement and the understanding that God can do the same for you. A little bit about me. I was born in, I was a born and bred New Yorker from the New York from the Big Apple who moved here 16 years ago and now I love to call North Carolina my home. My parents got divorced when I was 2 years old and I was raised solely by my mother. My father was a New York City firefighter and struggled with alcoholism, but he did break those chains and stop drinking when he was 50 years old. Sadly, all the years of drinking did do damage to his liver, and he passed away from cirrhosis back in 2020, even though he had stopped drinking for more than 20 years. Mm. My mother raised me as a single mom and worked very hard to provide for us. She was the best mother a girl could ask for, and we were incredibly close. Sadly, she passed away suddenly when, I was, when she was 53. I was 29 at the time, and my son was three. It was the worst thing that's ever happened in my life, and I went through years of depression and panic attacks because of that loss. But God Amen. has healed me from those things over the years. I started attending CR because of an addiction to opiates that was a slow but steady progression. The doctors diagnosed me with degenerative disc disease when I was 27 years old. I herniated a disc while working at a large residential building where I was the concierge and I received all the packages for the tenants. A large 70-pound bookshelf was delivered by UPS, and I attempted to move it and herniated a disc. When they did an MRI, they told me that I herniated my disc, but that I also had the beginnings of, de of degenerative disc disease. They recommended surgery, but I was dead set against it. I felt that I was too young to have back surgery. Fast forward seven months where I had sciatica so bad I was falling down in the street 
and grabbing onto complete strangers because the pain was shooting down my legs so bad. I finally agreed to the surgery and when they opened me up, it turned out that the jelly-like substance that seeps out of your disc had calcified and was pressing directly on my sciatic nerve. I got some relief from that surgery, but three years later, I herniated a disc in my neck and I had to have emergency surgery. For the sake of time, I won't go into all the details, but I have since had two more surgeries, both with cervical fusions, and currently, I'm fused in my cervical spine from top to bottom, and the bottom four discs of my lumbar have disintegrated where I have bone on bone. It's very painful, and I can literally feel my vertebrae grinding when I walk. I want to share a praise report with you, but first, I'd like to give you some context. I have been getting sciatica down my leg for almost a year now, and I, it was, I was experiencing pain down both of my arms and into my hands. It had been waking me up at night and was causing me extreme pain. I had an appointment with the neurosurgeon back in March, and I had MRIs done of my cervical and lumbar area of my spine. I also had a nerve conduction test to rule out carpal tunnel and nerve damage. I had already decided in my head that I was healed in the name of Jesus and was fully believing that the day that I went to get my results from the neurosurgeon, he was going to tell me that my back was healed and that it didn't make sense and that there was no way that the report could be from my back, from my back based on the past MRIs. I legitimately had PTSD from surgery, so you know I was like really nervous about these results. So when I went to see the doctor, he wound up telling me that, he said that he couldn't tell me the results of my cervical because he was waiting for the nerve conduction test from the other doctor, but that he was recommending another like fusion, a two level fusion on my lower back. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I mean, he was telling me this and I literally heard Charlie Brown's teacher because I was like zoned out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not the way this is supposed to go. So I left there a little defeated and I was like, you know, I'll have to think about this and pray about it. And he's telling me how they're gonna go in, they're gonna do this. and going to take three months of recuperating and a year total to heal and I was just not receiving the news so um, he told me he would contact me about the cervical area and he called me a week later to the day of the appointment and he said it doesn't make sense I don't understand that but your cervical area is fine so that was a major praise report for me and I was like I'll take partial healing Amen. so um, also I went back and I saw the doctor and I had a woman pray for the sciatica one day at church and since that day I have not been getting the pain down my leg. I still get pain in my lower back because of you know no discs there but um, I went to see the doctor for a follow-up and I told him like I'm really not open to surgery I'm not having that pain anymore and he was like well you know what he goes well what happened I said well somebody prayed for me and he goes well I can't argue with that <laughs> so I um, I'm not I'm not looking I'm not looking at surgery I'm not receiving that I'm going to believe for my complete healing of my lower back, and I just I don't want to go down that road. So a little bit about the addiction that ensued from being on opiates for a total of 16 years. It started with Tylenol and codeine, and then came all these other medications. I try not to name them because I don't want them to be a trigger for anybody. But just to give you an idea, I mean, it was like I started at the lowest level, and they just kept giving me more and more, and the dosage was higher and higher. and. I was on cancer patient dosages at the end. I mean, it really was crazy. Um, I was prescribed everything under the sun. Um, I said, um, along with that, I became depressed from being in pain all the time. So I was prescribed antidepressants. Then I started to struggle with sleep and anxiety. So they started adding benzos and sleep meds to the mix. And towards the end, I was on a mixture of pills that have literally killed people. How they were able to legally prescribe that mixture of meds still puzzles me to this day. The addiction was at its worst during the last two years, and that's when I started abusing my meds. Not because I was trying to get high, but because I was in so much pain. If you've ever taken these meds, you know that they stop being as effective. So I was taking more in one day than I was given. Then I started running out of my script a week early and going through horrible withdrawals. I started meeting people who also dealt with chronic pain and were prescribed the same meds as me, so I cozied up to them and I became fast friends. That way, when I got low on my pills, I'd borrow 10 here and 20 there. Now, I was an honest addict because the day that I got my script, I'd make my rounds and I'd pay each person back what I borrowed from them. It was at least three different people. So after paying back 10 pills to each person on day one, I was already short and I'd run out a week early again. So it really was a living hell and it was a vicious cycle. The, the absolute definition of insanity. <laughs> I was being treated like I was this horrible person by the medical community. 
when I go to the ER in legitimate pain, I hear the nurses and doctors talking about all the meds that I was on, and they frown upon me as if I chose this life. When I had my fusions, they couldn't even control my pain because my opioid receptors were saturated with opiates, and even the strongest meds that they put in an IV wouldn't touch my pain. So after 16 years of being on the meds and two years of the lifestyle I just shared, I was sick of it. I was tired of the monthly hamster wheel that I was on. The meds weren't even working anymore. I found myself watching the clock all day long, eagerly awaiting when I could take my next pill. I became someone I didn't even recognize anymore. So on New Year's Eve 2016, I went through horrible withdrawals because I ran out of my meds once again. I found myself on my knees, ugly crying, and begging God to help me. I told God that I didn't want to live like this anymore. I told him how tired I was. I was at the end of my rope and I didn't want to stay on the hamster wheel. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. I knew that I couldn't do it in my strength, but God could help me when I truly surrendered it to him. On January 20th, 2016, I took my last pill, and I'm so grateful to be coming up on nine years free from opiates. In those nine years, thank you. In those nine years, I have been to the ER with gallbladder issues, recently had it removed actually. Um, I've hurt my back, I've had an ulcer, I've had a few other gastro issues, and I have had the ER prescribed opiates. Most of those times I declined the meds, but one time three years ago, I allowed them to prescribe 10 pills because I was in severe pain. I can proudly share that I never took those pills. I pushed through the pain and they are old and probably ineffective and they're somewhere in my drawer, but it was a huge victory to not go to those when I was hurting. Amen. So I remember in the, the height of my addiction, I would be on my hands and knees searching my closet or tearing apart my drawers looking for a pill that I might have dropped or hidden. I even searched the floorboard of my car and found a nasty, dirt-covered pill that I took without even a thought in mind of what could be on it. I was desperate and I had lost all common sense. So I wanted to share my struggles with addiction with you because I wanted you to hear a different side of addiction, one that is all too common, of someone who didn't go and make a decision to start abusing drugs, who, but who was legally prescribed the drugs and it progressively turned into an addiction. Prior to this, I was the first person to look in the attic and pass judgment on them. I point them out to my son on the subway in New York and I tell him that's what drugs will do to you. My life verse is Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, the saving of many lives. That's one of my but God stories, but I have an endless amount of them. I believe that I have dealt with this thorn in my side because I can now come alongside someone who either has chronic pain or has struggled with addiction and I can empathize and sympathize with them and share the infamous feel, felt, found that I learned from Pastor George back at, in Leland at the Point Church. And it, that's, um, if you haven't heard about it, it's the three Fs. You can say that I feel your pain, I've been there as well. I felt the desperation and dysfunction that comes from it, but what I found is that we need to surrender it to God and let him have it all. I know that being on the receiving end of someone truly knowing what you're going through makes a world of difference. When I got clean, I had started attending the Point Church, and I went to Pastor George, and I shared my struggle. He shared the three Fs with me, and it was the best feeling to know that he really knew what I was going through, having been an addict himself. As I said, I wanted to share my addiction journey and victory with you, but that is a part of my past and something I no longer struggle with. The addiction was the reason I walked through the doors of CR, but what I've learned since is the real miracle and blessing. I shared at the beginning that I used to say, my name is Diana, and I struggle with. That list got so long that I used to joke around and said, I'm gonna get one of those little buttons and I could just record all the issues that I have instead of saying them all because the list was long. But I do wanna share them with you. I've learned over the years that I struggle with codependency, fear and anxiety, perfectionism, food issues, body dysmorphia, self-worth, anger, love and relationships, finances, ADD, OCD, a critical spirit, unforgiveness, and last year I got out of an emotionally, mentally, and verbally abusive relationship. So that's a long list. <laughs> and I can probably check off a couple more that you showed there. <laughs> My guess is there's more to uncover. And as they say, it's like peeling an onion. There's always a new layer to unfold. So I decided that I'm no longer going to rattle off all those issues anymore when I introduce myself. Now I'm going to say 
My name is Diana. I'm a grateful believer and follower of Jesus Christ, and I am more than a conqueror and a daughter of the King, because that is my identity, thanks to Jesus dying on the cross for me. I have come to the understanding that we tend to think that we know what's best for us, and I personally have been guilty of trying to make things happen in my own strength. I can look back and I can see that God was trying to gently nudge me in the right direction that he wanted me to go, but Diana could be a little bit hard-headed and I would continue down the wrong path. <laughs> One of those paths was a four-year detour. When I shared my testimony in years past, I talked about a man that I thought God had brought into my life. I really and truly thought that God's hand was in it and that we had this bright and beautiful future in ministry. The only challenge that he was, was that he was incarcerated. So I waited for him, I was faithful to him, and I stood by him for three and a half years. Back in 2016, I had conviction about sleeping with men prior to marriage, and I spent two and a half years being celibate, but sadly I blew that promise with an ex-boyfriend. I lived in sin for four months, and when I broke up with him, I took that vow again. Then I met my ex, and he was incarcerated, so I thought that God had a sense of humor and that he was just making sure I didn't blow it. I joked that this time there could be no intimacy and I had to take the time to get to know him. But when he got out after three and a half years of keeping that promise to God, we spent a total of six months together and in those six months, I blew my vow once again and started having an intimate relationship with him. My desire was to wait until marriage, but I failed at that sadly. In those six months, I also stopped reading my Bible, I stopped attending CR and church, and I'll tell you what, the devil does a really good job of putting shame, regret, and condemnation in your mind. I was so ashamed I didn't want to show my face. Then there was the fact that this relationship was very emotionally, mentally, and verbally abusive, and I didn't want to show my face because I knew that people would be able to see the sadness in my eyes. I can't begin to tell you the opposition I had from those that loved me when they found out that I was with them. I used to defend them and say that they had it all wrong and that he was different and that he was a good person. Imagine how I felt when I realized that they were all right. When we broke up, I was going through all the emotions, and then I had to share with everyone that it didn't work out. That was not a good feeling. I am not going to go into major details about what transpired in the six months, but I can tell you that the things he said and did to me grossly exasperated these struggles that I have with self-image, rejection, abandonment, and codependency. Talk about a setback from any type of growth I may have made. When we first broke up, I was angry, hurt, bitter, broken, and so much more. And I felt like I wasted four years. But I can look back now that I'm healed from the trauma and see that it's yet another but God story in my life. I have grown a great deal over those four years. I now know exactly what I want in my future husband. I used to say that I want to, I want to be with a Christian man and that was it. Now I have expectations and boundaries that I've implemented. He needs to be so much more than just a Christian. I want to see his fruit. I want to see the relationship he has with God. Matter of fact, my number one expectation is that he must love God more than he loves me. Because when he loves God with his whole heart, he will love me properly. Then I have an expectation for myself, and that is I will never put another man before God. I've done that my entire life as a codependent and a woman who wants so desperately to be loved and cared for. So this time, I'm keeping my eyes on God and when God chooses to bring us together, it will happen. I had a friend recommend a pastor who wrote a book that's a New York Times bestseller called Relationship Goals. That pastor also did a sermon series about relationships, and let me tell you, it's changed my entire outlook on relationships. I'm happy to share his name with you after, but I would highly recommend that you watch the sermon series. It opened my eyes and really helped me understand the dynamics of relationships. I have to share that I've had a lot of regret when I watched it, and I said if only I had seen the sermons when I was 20 years old. I could have saved myself from so much pain and heartache, but God, I firmly believe that if I had been married prior to all of this, I'd be in a very toxic and unhealthy marriage. Most of my life, I was under the belief that being loved by a man was where I would find my happiness, but boy, was I wrong. The truth is, is that Jesus is all that I need. He is the one who will never let me down, never hurt me, never abuse me or use me, and will always be with me. He is where I find my joy. There's a big difference between joy and happiness. So for the time being, I'm in a relationship with Jesus. My sweet friend got me this beautiful crown ring. I was sharing about that earlier. And I'm wearing it on my finger because I'm married to Jesus. When God brings the right man he has for me into my life and he puts a ring on it, then I'll take it off. 
<laughs> sounds like a song. <laughs> <laughs> last, so I picked up, um, I just picked up last night a year and a half for being celibate. Mm, yeah. And um, I'm also, I'm also going to be free next week, a year and a half from the abusive narcissistic relationship that I was in. But truth be told, I've always struggled with refraining from intimacy in a relationship. Something that I've done to help me with these struggles is writing scriptures on an index card and I take them to my mirrors and my walls. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth, that are on earth. The last one, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 5, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who did not know God. So now I want to switch gears and tell you about the amazing things God has done in my life. I'm here to tell you that God is so good. And although we go through trials and valleys, they make us who we are. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I think that when people accept Jesus and start to walk with God, they think that life is going to be a cakewalk and that they'll never again have any hardships. But it's during those hardships that we realize that God is with us. It's where the pressing and the crushing happens, and it forms us into the person that God created us to be. I can stand here and tell you that I've been through some stuff, but I can confidently tell you that I wouldn't be the woman I am today if not for those trials. If my life just went the way I wanted it to, I would never have the lived experiences I now have. Those trials are my but God stories. Those trials where I'm able to truly understand another person's struggles and I can encourage them and share with them what God has done in my life. Walking through the doors of CR is probably the best step I've ever taken in my life. In these rooms, it's where I've learned just how much I need God. This is where I made the connections and lifelong friends who I can literally do life with. When I was stuck in my addiction and character defects, I never felt so alone. The enemy had a field day whispering, you're not worthy, you're not lovable, you're an addict. Nobody wants to be your friend. You're too far gone from God's love. Those are all lies from the pits of hell. When we stay in isolation, that's where the enemy does his best work. He doesn't want us to have community and learn the eight principles and 12 steps. He certainly doesn't want us to do a step study and work through our junk from our past. You'd be amazed at the statistics of people in CR who start a step study, but they dip out during step four. It's astounding. That's because step four is hard. It's not easy talking about our hurts and brokenness from our past. But I can tell you that step four is where the chains are broken. And that's where I was able to break free from the prison that I was in. No, it's not a literal prison, but it kept me in bondage for years. I would like to encourage you to sign up for a step study and push through your step four. They say that you have to write down the good and the bad. If you just focus on the bad, it takes a toll on you. But also writing about the good makes all the difference. You don't share all of your stuff with everyone in the study. It's solely with your sponsor. So for seven years, I would share my testimony here at CR. And I would, for eight years, I would say now, I've been sharing it. And I would always say I'm excited to share what God brought me through. This time around, I was hoping to be able to say that I was walking in the path that God had for me. This is where Diana thought she should be. We have this tendency to think that we have it all figured out in our mind and where we're supposed to be in life. But when we start our days off saying, your will be done, Lord, and direct my steps, it changes everything. So I've gotten to the point, it only took me 53 years to get there, where I trust God more than I trust myself. I've also come to realize that all that we go through serves a purpose. And I give God, give God all the glory for the hard times. I'm able to thank him for the valleys that I've walked through. I thank him for the lessons that I've learned. I thank him for the literal pain that I've experienced. They're all my Genesis 50-20 life verses, but God. So one thing I need to own up to is that I've played a part in putting off the very clear direction that God is calling me to. I've allowed fear and intimidation and feelings of not being enough to keep me from the calling that God has for me. But I decided that enough is enough, and um, the enemy's tactics end now. So I've had all sorts of jobs in my adult life. Some being a salesperson at Best Buy, 
I work for the airlines here in Wilmington. I work for a home builder. I was a peer support specialist. I've been a nanny and I was also an on-air radio personality, which was by far the most amazing job I've ever had. I know that this is what God called me to do. You see, I absolutely love to encourage others and point people to Jesus. I had someone ask me recently, if money wasn't an object and you could do anything you want, what would it be? My reply was, go and make disciples, to encourage others and point people to Jesus. That is truly my heart's desire. It says in Psalm 24, may he grant you your heart's desires and fulfill all your plans. I learned from Pastor George years ago that God will give us the desires of our heart when they are in line with his will. Now that is very different than praying that you want a Ferrari or a mansion on the beach, but this desire is about advancing the kingdom. So sadly, after working for the radio station for close to three years, I was let go abruptly. I was angry, hurt, bitter, and more, and I had to heal from that. I had so many people suggest that I start a podcast, but I wasn't ready for that. I needed to work through all those emotions that I just shared. But you know what helped me the most? Praying for all of those who hurt me. By name, daily. Not every once in a while, but daily. I'm living proof that if you pray for someone you may be holding resentment against, it changes your heart, and I highly recommend it. Over the years since I left that position, I can't begin to tell you the amount of people who said they missed me being on air. The ongoing feedback I received was that I was called to do that. They said that I brought something different to the airwaves. They appreciated my transparency and authenticity. It's wild how, although consensus was in that I had a gift, the enemy continued to whisper, you can't do this. Who are you to start something like that? You don't know anything about computers and aren't capable. I lifted up this desire to God and I prayed for God to use me and send me. And in lightning speed, he's given me confirmation after confirmation. A few months ago, I made a post on Facebook with a picture of a microphone that a very well-known podcast producer had gifted me. I shared that I'm stepping out of faith and I figured if I did that and sort of put it out there, I'd be held accountable. So the following day, I went to a vision board party and I saw a sister in Christ who I have been Facebook friends with but I had only met once in a worship gathering and our interaction, thank you, <laughs> our interaction was minimal. She was at this vision board party and came over to me and hugged me and started crying. She said that I saved her life and that, and she had no idea that I was Sunny D. She said that she was in a really dark place and really struggling with her ailing husband and family challenges and that I spoke one day on air directly to her. She said that I encouraged her and she always wanted to meet the woman that, that, and see the face of the woman who had such an impact on her life. The hug she gave me was like anything I've ever received in my 53 years. I could feel her pain and severity of what she was telling me. She really was about to take her life that day and God used me. Um, it was an absolutely beautiful exchange and the final cherry on the top of the confirmations that I was called to do this. She was the third person to tell me over the years that I saved their life. So let me be clear, I know that this isn't me who saved their lives, I'm just a vessel, it was all God. He just used me to speak directly to them, so I give him all the credit and all the glory. But I am actually doing this thing. I am going to be starting an online radio station in 2025. I just got a three hour time slot, thank you. I just got a three hour time slot on Sunday afternoons at an online radio station. And the thing about that is it's a secular station, so I'll be bringing Jesus to it. So I'm really excited about that. And it's good practice for me for the station that I want to start come the new year. But, you know, I, I literally just feel like I need to like take that first step and God's going to handle the rest because it's just about obedience, you know? So, um, let's see. I, I said here, I'm, I'm going to trust God and let him lead the way. I just want to share the love of God. I want to play songs that go along with an encouragement or a topic that God puts on my heart. It's about being willing and open to allowing God to use me and send me. He will work out all the details. I'm just going to be obedient. Matter of fact, that's my one word this year is obedient. For the past 15 years, I've chosen one word that I pray about and choose, and then I apply it and I, fo I, I focus on that word all year. In the past, I've done patience, still, trust, more, surrender, and more. But this year, before 2024 even approached, I got obedient. Now, I think that most people hear obedient and they think of rules and restrictions and limitations. 
But I don't see it that way. I've learned once again from Pastor George, who I went to church for many years, that there is nothing that we can or can't do to make God love us more or less. It's not about works, but the complete work that Jesus did on the cross. It's about him dying for me and for you. But the desire of my heart is to be obedient to God. You see, the Bible is a guidebook of principles that we're supposed to follow. Not because God's trying to limit us or control us, but because he loves us and, he, and he's giving us parameters to follow so, they, so that we don't get hurt or essentially destroy our lives. It's like guardrails and guidelines to keep us safe. With that being said, this very independent, strong-willed, outspoken New Yorkian is submitting and surrendering her life and will to Christ's care and control, which is one of the eight principles. Because in Romans 7.18 it says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, but I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. The Bible also says in Psalm 73.26, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, and my portion forever. I've come to the conclusion that Diana's way has gotten me into nothing but trouble. So I'm gonna do it God's way. Amen. <laughs> it's about complete surrender, guys. So whatever you may be holding on to, can I encourage you to lay it at the foot of the cross? Amen. And one very important part of that is leave it there. Don't pick it back up. Yeah. I've done that so many times, or I've given him some things, but I've kept a few things in my back pocket because I thought that I had them under control. Mm -hmm. But I was wrong on that. I didn't. So I lay it all at the foot of the cross. All the things that I thought I could control. My dreams of getting married and the man I'm supposed to be with. My son's salvation and relationship with God. The people who hurt me and the pain and trauma of my past. The anxiety, the fear of the future, the current medical stuff that I'm going through. All of it. I lay it at the foot of the cross. So my prayer is that something that I shared tonight touched your hearts and possibly stirred something inside you. At the very least, you saw what God can and will do in your life when you surrender it all to him. So in closing, my name is Diana, and I'm a grateful believer and follower of Jesus Christ, and I am more than a conqueror. I am a daughter of the king, a masterpiece, an heir to the throne, a warrior, known, chosen, worthy, loved, and more than enough. Thank you for letting me know. I had a hot flash while I was up there. <laughs> you didn't need your sweater after you got started. No, imagine that was on. All right. You yeah. want to turn the camera off? Honey? Yeah. Thank you. You don't want to be on the camera? All right. Time for some chips. Chip, 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 chip. That's tonight, right?